All right, g'day guys. Welcome back to the final trade update that you will find uh, for the 2021 AFL season. Of course, trade period deadline was earlier today. As you're watching this, it was yesterday. So in today's video, I'm just going to try and unpack what basically happened in the final day. I think a lot of people felt it was a little bit underwhelming compared to previous years. I think if you use 2020 as a sort of benchmark there, 2020 the final day was insane with all those deadline deals going right to the wire. This year, by comparison, was a lot more low-key, but some things did definitely still happen. And in today's video, I'm going to try to just sort of go through all the deals that did take place, but equally go through some of the deals that didn't take place and go through the reasons why. As always, guys, before we get into it, I do invite you to consider subscribing to the channel if you're enjoying the trade content. If you do enjoy the videos, I would appreciate you giving them a like as well. But anyway, let's get into the final trade update. So first of all, we'll talk about some of the deals that fell through. Uh, some of these were high key names and some of these were fairly low key names. One of them was Tristan Cherry, who was going to move from North Melbourne to the St. Kilda Footy Club. He's a ruck forward and St. Kilda was sort of in the market for a player to sort of be a, I guess, a long-term replacement for Paddy Ryder, but even a short-term sort of depth option for them, one who can play forward as well. The sticking point in this deal was that Tristan Cherry was contracted to North Melbourne and with Goldstein sort of towards the end of his career, it could be his last year, it could be one of his last years they were unwilling to let go a contracted player cheaply and apparently they asked for a future second rounder as well as an exchange of future third rounders as well so pretty steep price for a guy who's played i think it's either 12 games or under 10 i can't remember exactly but not too many and that really does reflect the inflated price that tours have particularly when they're contracted so st kilda failed to get their man and if they do want to go ahead and obtain some ruck depth they're either going to have to do it through the draft or wait a year until the next trade period Another deal that failed to get done today, despite much speculation, was Bobby Hill from GWS, who, of course, tried to make his way very late in the piece from the Giants to the Essendon Footy Club. Again, another player who's contracted, and despite the fact that he sort of sought a trade back on compassionate grounds, I think he's got a pregnant partner, some more family support in Melbourne as opposed to Sydney. He'd nominated Essendon, although there was a sort of a link to Collingwood there as well as a sort of backstop if Essendon couldn't get the deal done. But ultimately, this deal fell through. I think it would have helped a lot had uh, Ian Hill given them a lot more notice but because it sort of happened in the middle of the trade period, GWS didn't really have time to facilitate this trade and on top of that, they went into this trade period needing a small forward. They'd been on the market for Chad Wingard and Luke Bruce from Hawthorne but eventually couldn't get those deals done. So to lose another small forward on top of that would have been a massive blow as well and when you consider Toby Green's going to miss the first five weeks of next season it makes sense for them to keep the contracted hill for one more year. Apparently they offered a future second round pick from Essendon, which is probably about right in terms of fair value for a player of Ian Hill's ability. But the Giants held firm, and fair enough too, he's a required player for the time being, although it's more or less just delaying the inevitable. He's probably going to leave to Victoria in 12 months' time. I touched on Luke Bruce there, and he's another player that sort of popped up very late. In fact, I don't know if it was just yesterday or even this morning that his name was first thrown in the hat of potential trades from Hawthorne to GWS. As we've well documented, Hawthorne have been well and truly looking for another way to get into the top 20 of this year's draft. And supposedly after Wingard turned down offers to join GWS, Luke Bruce also turned it down. Now this is an interesting little scenario here where from the sounds of it, Hawthorne and the Giants had actually already negotiated a trade for Bruce, which involved pick 13, according to Callum Toomey. But in a similar theme to the Wingard situation, it seems like while Hawthorne was keen, Luke Bruce was not. I believe he's still got two years left on his contract to Hawthorne and wants to probably play out the rest of his career at that footy club. So it's a weird, bizarre situation where a contracted player doesn't want to move and the team that keeps him is probably strangely disappointed because they miss out on a top 13 pick. As good as a player as Luke Bruce is, he probably doesn't really fit Hawthorne's required age profile right now. So I can see why Hawthorne's strategy was to try and trade back into the draft. But their overall strategy of trying to improve their draft position was one they couldn't quite execute on this trade period. The fourth deal that failed to get done today was one we kind of knew from about 24 hours ago wasn't going to get done. It's Rory Lobb to the GWS Giants. We know that he was willing to take a pay cut to head back to the Giants, which is a strange scenario because he requested a trade from there something like two, three years ago. He's on a massive amount of money at Fremantle, 700k a year, reportedly willing to take a bit of a pay cut. But according to his manager, supposedly GWS just couldn't quite do enough to make the deal work. And at the end of the day, Rory Lobb's contracted, so Fremantle's asking price may realistically have been something in the top 
20 or even the first round. From reports, what GWS was offering was a future second round pick, so it was one that wasn't enough of an incentive for Fremount to really get involved in this trade. So Rory Lobb's another one who will wait at least another 12 months before he gets an opportunity to move clubs. Now let's talk about some of the deals that actually did take place today, and the most notable of which was actually the first, and that was Jordan Dawson, who finally moved from the Sydney Footy Club to the Adelaide Crows. He was eventually traded for Melbourne's future first round pick. So this is a first round pick that's obviously tied to Melbourne's ladder position next year. Reportedly, Sydney had not been so keen on receiving the Bulldogs pick of 17, which Adelaide had tried to acquire previously. And it's kind of ironic that the pick they eventually end up with is actually potentially going to be worse than pick 17 this year. If the Demons win the flag again, that pick could blow out to about 18 to 20. But it is probably a worthy gamble considering the fact that Melbourne could realistically say finish fifth and win one final. Like I know I've backed them in and said they probably won't and I to be honest, I think they're probably the premiership favourite for next year, but it's not beyond the realm of possibility that they don't have such a crash hot season. So there's a bit of a gamble there where Sydney could actually end up with pick 13 or 14. Either way, according to Charlie Gardner, they're pretty uh, disappointed with the way that deal went down. They tried to extract as much value as they possibly could, but the longer the deal went, the more it played into Adelaide's hands with the preseason draft as a realistic threat. And reportedly, Adelaide told them this is our final offer. So Sydney felt they couldn't improve on the potential deal they were receiving and had to accept slight under for Jordan Dawson. On the other hand, Jordan Clark was a deal that did get done in that final IR of the trade period. Fremantle, after doing a bit of haggling with Geelong over whether it would be pick 19 or pick 22, ended up sending pick 22 and a future third round pick for Clark and a future fourth round pick. So after losing Chera, they'll take a couple of young up and coming players in Clark and Brody, neither of whom were quite on the Chera level, but at least fill some sort of depth in their side. It's interesting to me that Peter Bell has highlighted Jordan Clark as a halfback flanker. I know Bush and particular was hoping he would sort of be developed as a wingman because Fremantle kind of have a fair few halfback flankers. I personally see Jordan Clark more as a natural defender. So it'd be interesting to see if he starts round one for them or if he pushes someone out. I think if he's been given a four-year contract, that suggests they rate him as their best 22 player. So they'll take him and head to the draft with three top 20 picks. It'd be interesting to see their strategy this year if they start to draft maybe more WA-based kids. There's a few in the top 20 that they could potentially pick or if they'll simply go best available again, knowing some of those kids kids could be from Vic Metro and eventually request a trade home again soon. The Peter Laddams deal also got done. Uh, this one happened pretty late in the piece as well with the Swans acquiring his services and they've slid back in the draft from pick 12 to pick 16. Conversely, Port Adelaide go from pick 16 to pick 12 and receive a future third round pick as well. So it's interesting how these two sides appear to rate the draft. I think from a Sydney perspective, from what I've heard, the draft is fairly even between 5 and 20 in terms of the talent pool. So from their eyes, Maybe they don't see it as a big loss and perhaps Port Adelaide do see a bit of a golf in talent there. Port Adelaide have been fantastic at nailing their first rounders in the last few years as well. So I think they'll be very happy to take pick 12 to the draft in what is a fairly strong top 20, I would suggest. But additionally, it's great for Sydney to get some young depth as well. He's fairly young compared to some of the other rucks they have on the list like Hickey and Sinclair in particular. So not only is he a short-term depth solution, he's potentially a long-term ruck for them as well. So it's a good result. Speaking of rucks, there was three other final trades that got done on the final day. It was Max Lynch headed from Collingwood to Hawthorne. The Pies received two future third round picks and Hawthorne received Lynch a future third and a future fourth. Darcy Fort finally made his way to the Lions. I'm kind of curious as to why that deal took quite so long, but he and 41 went to Brisbane while the Cats received 50 and a future third round pick. And finally, Jonathan Segler moved from the Hawthorne Footy Club to their arch rivals Geelong. The Cats flicked across their future third that they had just received to Hawthorne for Segler. And in addition to Segler, received a future fourth round pick back. So it's a curious scenario here where Geelong probably still need some, you know, young talent into their side and they flip Darcy Fort for yet another aging Ruckman for some reason. I suppose he adds more in the short term, but again, between losing Fort and Clark, the strain on their young talent continues. So it's an interesting one, that strategy. I'm not saying I'm particularly critical of it just yet, but it's one to watch. And if they don't get this transition right, they could fall off a cliff in a few years, no doubt. But anyway, guys, that caps off what was a fairly low key AFL trade deadline day. It's funny to think that, you know, all this talk about growing player movement over the next few years and the way the game's trending, that we just had 
what felt like one of the quietest trade periods we've had in some time. I think we were a little spoiled with 2020 with all the drama that unfolded in that final day. And to be honest, it's kind of relief. I think there is there is an upper limit to how much player movement I want to see. You want to see the best players also being loyal to the club. Thank you so much for all your support throughout this trade period deadline day. It's been a huge growth period for the channel as well. And uh, the content still yet to come. I'm probably going to do one more video on the trade period, sort of assessing the winners and losers. That'll probably be out in the next day or so. I haven't quite figured that out yet, but... Once again, really appreciate all those who have recently jumped on the channel. No real plans to slow down yet. I don't know if I'll go daily through the next you know, few months, but uh, in terms of the draft, I certainly plan to cover that. It'd be great to see you guys uh, along for the journey as well. I've got a few different ideas for content in that space as well. So again, thank you so much. If you have watched the content and enjoyed it, I'd really appreciate you subscribing. If you haven't already, like the video if you enjoyed it, as I always say, and I'll see you in the next video, guys. Cheers.